truth here that I want to share with you. It's from Hebrews chapter 7, and we're going to begin at verse 1. And it says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham in turning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first, everybody say first, first, first by being interpretation king of righteousness. Everybody say righteousness. righteousness. And after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Everybody say after that. After that. And everybody say peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood, and it is yet far more evident, for after that, after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that's my subject today. I'd like to speak to you about the order of Melchizedek. Praise God, the order of Melchizedek. Could we lift our voice and ask the blessing of God upon the preaching of his word? Lord, I thank you for your people, your precious and wonderful people that have gathered into this place. I pray in Jesus' name that you will move upon this service and upon the preaching of your word. Help us, I pray, in Jesus' name to receive of your spirit, to live in the beautiful principles of your word that we may... Live the abundant life you came to give us. We thank you for it, Lord, and we give you all praise and glory and honor in Jesus' matchless and mighty name we pray. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. And amen. God bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. You're so kind and gracious to stand. And we honor you for that. Melchizedek, this very unique character figure in the word of God perhaps you have heard of him maybe you haven't and that's okay we're going to talk about him today but but uh, uh, many students of the scripture have discussed Melchizedek but always with a tinge of mystery connected to this man and it, it, to the point that people have debated who he was what he represented because the Bible says some very interesting things about him. And, and so some have even wondered, was he a manifestation of God on the earth as a man? Uh, some have wondered, of course, this because he so beautifully typifies and illustrates Jesus, the Messiah, who is coming. And so I'm going to talk today about the order of Melchizedek, but I don't want to give any false impression that you're going to walk out of here and say, oh, now I know everything I need to know about Melchizedek. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to settle any debate about who he was necessarily, but there are a, just a couple of truths that I would like to extract from what the scriptures say about this man. And he has evoked much discussion and mystery about his personage and so we're going to talk a little bit about that but uh but it's what's really interesting is that the bible doesn't say much about him there are only three books in the bible that reference him and the actual summation of his life is encapsulated in three verses of scripture the actual activity of Melchizedek occurs across the span of three verses of Scripture. And they're found in Genesis chapter 14. I'm going to read them to you, verses 18, 19, and 20. Here's, here's what the Word of the Lord says about Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, it's the first thing we know about him, his name. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, which we know is the king of peace from the book of Hebrews, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. 
And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. And there you have it. That's the story of Melchizedek. And we don't hear any more about him. We don't think any more about him. We don't say any more about him until you get to one of the most prolific and beautiful psalms. Hard to quantify which is the most prolific and beautiful of the psalms, but this truly has a ring to it that, that, that helps us to understand the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he is in fact Messiah. It's found in Psalm 110. And as the lordship of Jesus Christ is being exalted and verified and foretold, in the middle of this great psalm, verse 4, there's just this arbitrary hearkening back to those three verses in the book of Genesis that I read. Verse 4 of Psalm 110. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Now, pause right there. I want you to think about how powerful that statement is. The Lord, the self-sufficient one, the self-existent God, he who is above all, through all, and in all. The Lord hath sworn. His word, he has settled it. It is established forever in the heavens. He hath sworn and will not repent. This is an unshakable, unshakable word from God. And here it is. Thou, Messiah, art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This guy that we only know about because of three verses found in the book of Genesis in an interaction he had with Abram before his name was even Abraham. Yeah. Melchizedek is interacting with him. And, and so there you have it. That's, that's all the Old Testament says about him. Three verses to tell us what happened in his life and one verse to say, oh, and by the way, Messiah is going to be made a priest for after, forever after the order of that guy that we read about with, that talked to Abram. And so that's all we have until you get to the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews stops the press and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, just one second, everybody. Before you just go skipping through those little verses of Genesis and that one verse of Psalms, I want us to take a look at this man. And this is what he says. He said, let us consider how great this man was. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is doing. He is calling our attention to the consideration of the greatness of this man Melchizedek. And the metric by which he gauges the greatness of Melchizedek is, is this. He said, Abraham gave tithe unto him. Now, when you, when, you, when you say that, you're saying a lot to a Hebrew people. And that's who the writer was writing to. This is the father of the faithful. This is the friend of God. This is the man who believed in God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And by faith, he left his father's house. By faith, he left his father's kindred. And he went looking for a city that hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. And the blessing of God was multiplied unto him. This is how favored Abraham was. God said, blessing, I will bless you. Multiplying, I will multiply you. I will bless them who bless you. I will curse them who curse you. Every place whereon you, you set your foot, I will give it to you. The Lord blessed Abraham abundantly. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, if, and that's great. That's how blessed Abraham was. And he gave tithe unto Melchizedek. So right there is a, an amazing understanding of just how great this man Melchizedek was. And it's important for us to recognize the principle of tithing is established in the order of Melchizedek. Which means it predates the law of Moses. So, so anybody that ever says that tithing is relegated to the law of Moses, they just, not, they just don't understand the scriptures. It's, it's not relegated to the law of Moses. It predates the law of Moses. It is forever established in the order of Melchizedek, which is the priesthood uh, by which Christ is made a priest. 
And so, so it predates the law and it was not fulfilled by the law of Moses. It is in, in existence today because it is a divine principle. And Abraham was establishing that with Melchizedek. And so when he does, it, the writer of Hebrews says, let's consider just how great this man was. Abraham gave tithe unto him. And the reason Abraham gave tithe unto Melchizedek is clear. It was through Melchizedek that Abraham begins to develop an understanding of things to come. He sees in this man a type, if you please, or a shadow, a figure of Jesus who is to come. And that was common in the Old Testament. Many places where God would give glimpses and shadows and types and, and little flashes uh, and glimmers of, of, of uh, the profile of Jesus who is to come as a schoolmaster that would lead people unto Christ because they were, they were, their minds were darkened by the wickedness of their ways. And so they, he would give them glimpses and glimmers and flashes of Christ is coming, Christ is coming. And Melchizedek was a bright, shining flash to Abram that Jesus Christ is in fact coming. Jesus said this. He said there were moments where Abraham saw his day. He said, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced to see my day. Because they were saying, what, what, what do you know about Abraham? He said, let me tell you about Abraham. Abraham knows, he, and he knew I was coming. He rejoiced to see my day because before Abraham was, I am. I'll tell you one of the times Abraham saw the day of Christ. He saw the day of Christ when he was upon Mount Moriah and was getting ready to lay that, that son of his, Isaac, down upon the altar. And before he lifted the knife to slay that son of promise, the Lord said, Do not slay your son, for now I know that you fear God. He looked behind him and found a ram rustling in the thicket. And I want you to know that was a day that Abraham saw the day of Christ. Because what that ram did for Isaac is exactly what Jesus did for us. It was us that was supposed to be on that altar. It was us that was supposed to be on that cross. It was us that was supposed to have wounds and bruises and stripes and chastisement. Oh, but God, who is rich in mercy. You better believe Abraham rejoiced to see the day of Christ. But he also saw the day of Christ in Melchizedek. One of the ways that he saw the day of Christ in Melchizedek is look what Genesis 14 says about this man Melchizedek. Let's consider how great he was. This is what the Bible said. He was a priest of the Most High God. This was before the law of Moses. This was before there was a priesthood. He was a priest, not just any priest, a priest of the Most High God. He was the right kind of priest. And he was the king of Salem or Salem, which is peace. And this is unique because God didn't let kings be priests and he didn't let priests be kings. The reason he didn't let that happen is because there is only one who is king and priest and his name is Jesus. And, and what's interesting is that when we rule and reign with him, he's going to make us kings and priests, which means he's going to make us like unto him. But here is Mel. Listen, God didn't play games with that. He didn't let kings be priests and priests be kings. When Saul tried to offer the offerings of a priest, the Lord rejected him as king of Israel. When Uzziah tried to offer the offerings of the priest, the Lord put a leprosy in his forehead and shut him up for the rest of his life. He didn't let people be kings and priests because that was a type of Messiah. Interesting, though, that he let David... Eat the showbread that only priests could eat while David was anointed to be king. Interesting that he was okay with David putting on a linen ephod and praising the Lord before the ark of God as it came that way. Even though he was acting like a priest in the office of a king. Why? Because David was doing this out of hunger and out of worship. And in so doing, he was a type of Christ to come. Melchizedek stands before Abram as both priest and king. That is a glimpse and a little foresight into the Messiah who is coming. The other thing that Messiah did that showed Christ to Abraham was the lunch he brought. He brought a lunch. He brought bread and he brought wine. And he set them before Abram. Listen, that was more than just lunch. 
The bread and the cup are significant. If you are familiar with the bread and the cup, we take it and we call it the Lord's Supper. And when we take of the Lord's Supper, we know why we do it. It's the bread and the cup, and the Lord told us what it represents. He said that the bread represents my body, which is broken for you, and the cup represents my blood, which was shed for you. He said, do it as often as you would. This do in remembrance of me. So when we take of the Lord's Supper, the bread and the cup, we are remembering that there was a body that was broken for us and that there was blood that was shed for us. Abraham and Melchizedek had that same supper. It represented the same body and the same blood. Not in remembrance of, but in anticipation of. Abram was being taught by Melchizedek there is a body coming and that body is going to be broken for the sins of mankind and there is blood that's going to be shed and it has the power and the purity to deliver everyone who will from their sins. That's what Melchizedek was teaching Abram. Now let me just tell you really quick for just a moment that body, that bread is not just any old kind of bread. That's not wonder bread. That's not just wheat bread. That's not pumpernickel sourdough, whatever, banana nut bread. That bread was unleavened bread, which means it was not tainted and it was not touched by the corruption and the rudiments of the world because it represents one who is coming, who is pure and holy and righteous. I want to tell you that the purity, the holiness, and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is absolutely paramount to what he did to redeem us from our sins. He is a pure Savior. There is no sin in him. No transgression in him. The Bible says that he was tempted in all points as we are tempted, but was without sin. There's a reason he was without sin. Because when he went to the cross, he had to be a sinless body. That is the only thing that gives him power over death. The devil had the power of death. But Jesus, when he went to the cross, he didn't go just as another martyr for a good cause. He didn't go as just another assassinated historical figure. He went as a spotless, sinless Lamb of God, perfect and holy and undefiled. He went as unleavened bread. And I'm going to tell you why. Because the only thing that gives death jurisdiction over us is the sin that is in our body. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What gives death power over us is the sin that is present in our members. But when Jesus went down into the grave, he went into the grave unlike any other human being that ever went down into the grave. He went into the grave as an obedient man, obedient to the law of God. Death had never encountered somebody that it could not tempt to sin and succeed in that. Now death is encountering someone who had been tempted in absolutely every way that was humanly possible, but overcame that temptation with obedience unto God. So in the examination of his pure body, death is looking for the mark of transgression, and there is none. Hell is looking for the mark of iniquity, but can't find it. The grave is trying to find where sin occurred in this body, and there is no place where sin occurred in this body. Finally, they look at one another and say, what do we do? We don't, we've never dealt with anything like this. And they realize there's only one thing we can do. We have to let it go. We don't have any jurisdiction over this body. I 
I want you to know why Jesus was tempted in all points as we are tempted. Because he was facing every temptation that you and I would ever face. And was in, he was facing it intentionally. He was encountering it on our behalf. And so he was faced with the temptation to lie, but he overcame lying. He was faced with the temptation to hate, but he overcame hate. He was tempted to fornicate, but he overcame fornication. He was tempted to envy, but he overcame envy. With each victory over every one of those temptations, he was conquering it on our behalf. Now we... My God. I want you to understand what it, what we're saying when we say that we are in the body of Christ. We are in a sinless body. We are in a body that has power over sin. We are in a body that has already overcome the wicked one. It was so important that he was obedient. His obedience is so so primary to everything that we do that 33 and a half years that he lived where he was obedient unto death even the death of the cross is so vital that's the life that's the life that the bible is talking about when the bible says i have come to give you life and that more abundantly or i am the resurrection and the life it's not just talking about some vague energy or or some nebulous uh, uh breath no no it, it is referring to the life <laughs> That he lived. There were 33 and a half years lived the way we are supposed to live, but are unable to live. But he already did it on my behalf. Hallelujah. This is why he said, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. In him was life and the life was the light that shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. The devil cometh, the thief cometh, but to steal, kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that more abundantly. It was that life that he already lived. This is what the Bible says, when it, what it means when it says that you are to cast down imaginations. And you are to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The obedience of Christ is, listen, this is what, this is, the obedience is Christ. The obedience of Christ is even greater than his sacrifice. That's what Saul was hearing from Samuel when Samuel said to him, to obey is better than sacrifice because the sacrifice of Christ means nothing if he wasn't obedient. If he was sinning and reveling and rebelling and that when he's then crucified to the cross, that blood has no power. That's tainted blood. But because he was sinless, hallelujah, the obedience of Christ was even greater than the sacrifice of Christ because the obedience of Christ made the sacrifice of Christ efficacious. For our redemption. So let me tell you what happened. The, 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 the bread represents the body. Melchizedek is giving the bread. And Abram is breaking the bread. And it's, it's dawning on him. There's a body coming. There's a body coming. And, and, then, and then he says, here's the cup. The body and the blood are so intertwined. The blood is inside the body. And everything that the body experiences is being recorded in the blood. This is why Moses said to the children of Israel, do not eat the flesh of the animal, or the, pardon me, the blood of the animal. He said, if you eat the blood of the animal, then, then you, you, there's going to be something tainted in you because the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, I don't mean to mess with your medium rare steaks. So I know we're not under the law of Moses Praise God, and I'm not, you know, we'd all be received with thanksgiving. But, but, but he said, don't eat the blood of the animal because the life of the flesh is in the blood. In other words, the decisions that that animal made when that animal walked and roamed the earth, those decisions are in its blood. If it ate something that you would never dream of eating, when you eat its blood, it's like you ate what it ate. 
Because its activity, the activity of its fleshly life is recorded in its blood. I want you to know that this is true of Jesus. The activity of the life he lived on earth is recorded in his blood. Hallelujah. I, that, that, that victory over hate, it's in his blood. That victory over fornication is in his blood. That victory over envy and lust and rebellion and pride and iniquity, it's in his blood. You better believe there's power in the blood. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There is power, power, wonder working, power in the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. This is what happens when you are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why Bishop Haywood wrote that song, Are You Baptized in the Body? Hallelujah. Are you baptized into that body? Because inside that body is the blood of Jesus. And when you are immersed into that blood, that blood has power you and I do not have, but must have in order to overcome the wicked one. When Moses was at Egypt, the Bible says that he put the rod into the waters of Egypt and the waters were turned to blood. And that everything inside the waters died when the water was turned to blood. That means every organism died. Every fish died. Every tadpole died. Every, every bacterium died. Every virus died. Every parasite died when the water was turned to blood. Can I tell you that's what happened when I was baptized in Jesus' name? Hallelujah. I stepped into the water one day and the water was chilly and cold. It chilled this natural body of mine, but it didn't chill my soul. And so I stepped down just a little bit deeper. Hatama and the man of God baptized me in the only saving name, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He said, Joel, upon the confession of your faith in the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord, and Savior Jesus Christ I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins I want you to know when I came up out of that water the water was water when I got into it but when he spoke the name of Jesus over me as I was immersed in that water that water turned to blood and every sinful parasite died and every sinful transgression died and every sinful bacteria died in the blood of the Lamb of God hallelujah Melchizedek is showing this to Abram he's saying here's the bread and here's the wine here's his body and here's his blood his body which will be broken his blood which will be shed. You are going to be able to overcome the sin that has dragged mankind into death since Adam's fall. Of course Abraham rejoiced to see his day. What a beautiful plan of salvation. To be saved from our sins. To be saved from a devil's hell. And, 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 and the Bible says that Melchizedek blessed him. He blessed Abram. Here we see a, a figure of the infilling of the Spirit of God, the blessing of the Most High God upon Abram. And then the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Christ, referring to Psalm 110.4, is made forever a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And this is, this is what I, I want to focus our attention on, the order of Melchizedek. Because Christ is made a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and there's only one problem with that, not really a problem, but, but at face value, what order? What order of Melchizedek? Because the order of a priesthood is a chronological order. When we talk about the Levitical order or the Aaronic order, we're talking about the order of the priesthood of Aaron. 
Aaron was the priest and his sons were priests and their 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 sons were priests. That is the order of a priesthood. It is the order of the Levitical priesthood. It was the tribe of Levi who were the priests. The only order of a priesthood in the Levitical sense is that of a chronological order. And the problem with this is that we don't know who Melchizedek's parents were. And the writer of Hebrews says... Without father, without mother, without descent, there's no lineage. Now some people, some people, you know, look at that and think he's saying he didn't have a father or mother. Other people look at that and say he's saying we have no record of his father and mother. I'm not here to settle that debate. I'm just simply here to say we don't know if he had a father or mother. And if he did, who they were. There's no order listed for Melchizedek. There is not a Levitical or a chronological order of Melchizedek. And this is why. Because he, Jesus Christ, was not made a priest after the law of Moses. He was made a priest after the power of an endless life. He was not made a priest after a carnal commandment. He was made a priest that is an unchanging priesthood. There's no one before him. There's no one after him. The fact that we have no record of Melchizedek's parents or children is a testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ has no one to replace him. He has no one to predate him. He is before all. He is above all. Hallelujah. Be, be, be before him. There was none other. He is God and God alone. And his priesthood is not based on a chronological order, but there is an order. And there is only one order that is listed concerning Melchizedek and I'm going to take you to it right now the book of Hebrews go back to our text Hebrews chapter 7 and if we could just throw verse number 2 up onto the screen Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2 to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first everybody say first, first. this is the only order relative to Melchizedek in the scriptures first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. This is the order of Melchizedek. First, righteousness. After that, peace. That's the order. That's the only order we have in the scriptures concerning Melchizedek. And the writer of Hebrews takes the time to say, it's in order. First, righteousness. And after that, peace. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants to give you peace. God wants your family to be at peace. God wants to give you a perfect peace. That when your mind is stayed on Him, you will have perfect peace. He wants to give you peace like a river. Peace that passes understanding. Peace, hallelujah, wonderful peace coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, with fathomless billows of love. He wants your marriage to be at peace. He wants your finances to be at peace. He wants your children to have peace. He wants your body to be at peace he wants your mind to be at peace and I've come to tell you he is the peace speaker even the winds and the waves obey his voice who is this man that even the winds and the waves obey his voice he is the peace speaker he is the peace giver he is the peace keeper he is the peace maker But I want you to know that peace comes in order. Before there's peace, there's righteousness. And everybody wants peace. But not very many people want righteousness. But this is the order of Melchizedek. This is the order of Christ's priesthood. And it is the only order. And it does not ever come out of this order. First righteousness. And after that, peace. Every world leader promises peace. Every U.S. president has made it a fixture in their inaugural speech. Peace. 
peace, peace. This world will cry peace, peace. And then come a sudden destruction. Some people have said peace. And they try to find it in some kind of a weed or in some kind of a chemical. And you won't find it in a chemical. You won't find it in a bottle. You won't find it in an illicit relationship. You won't find it in a sinful behavior. You only find peace in the order of Melchizedek. First righteousness. And after that, peace. peace. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Jesus told him. He said, consider the lilies, how they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of these. If God then so clothed the grass of the field, which is today in the field and tomorrow, cast into the oven, how much more shall he clothe you? Take no thought, therefore, for the morrow, what you shall put on, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink. For the Father knoweth that you have need of these things. Here's what you need to do seek first seek first get it in order get the order right seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things you want and need shall be added unto you oh hallelujah first Corinthians chapter 6 first Corinthians chapter 6 tells us Hallelujah, in the ninth verse, it tells us this. Know ye not? This, I love the incredulity of this. He's, he's, he's expecting us to know this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? I'm just going to go through a list here. And if any of this is in us, we need to repent from it and let God make us whole so we can have peace in our lives. This is the stuff that's robbing you of peace. Unrighteousness is robbing you of peace. Be not deceived. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicators won't. Idolaters won't. Adulterers won't. Effeminate won't. Abusers of themselves with mankind will not. Thieves won't. The covetous won't. The drunkards won't. The revilers won't. The extortioners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But now you... You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's baptism in Jesus' name. That's the infilling of the Holy Ghost and fire. That's how you're washed and sanctified and justified. This is the righteousness of His people. And here, uh, if we put Hebrews 7 and 2 back up there, I just want to point something out to you because I, I, actually, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's just, can you follow me for just a moment here? I'm almost done, I promise you. Yeah. I'm almost done. But, but I want you to notice this. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all? First being by interpretation. Everybody say by interpretation. By interpretation. King of righteousness. And after that, also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So this is our writer of Hebrews is saying, we first meet Melchizedek and the first thing we find out about him is that he's the king of righteousness. And then after that, he's the king of peace. So let's go back to Genesis 14 and 18. Could we do that? Just look at Genesis 14 and 18 real quick because we're going to go back at what this says about Melchizedek and see if that's the order. Look at this in Genesis chapter 14 and verse number 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, wait a minute. I thought Hebrews 7, 2 said, first, he's king of righteousness, and after that, he's the king of peace. Here it's just, and Melchizedek, king of peace. But Hebrews 7, 2 definitely said he was first king of righteousness, and after that, he was king of peace. But this is saying Melchizedek, king of peace. Hebrews 7, 2 says something very important. It says, first, by interpretation. The name Melchizedek means king of peace righteousness in other words his righteousness is in his name and the righteousness you seek it's not in your abilities it's not in your willpower it's not in your discipline it's in the name of Jesus Christ to understand the order of his righteousness you can only get it by unlocking the powers of His name. 
It's when that name replaces yours and I stop being Joel Urshan and I let his name come over my life. I want to tell you why that's so important. Here's why. Because when I get before God and I stand before him in judgment, there's going to be two books present. And, and one is going to be the Joel's book of life. Okay, the Joel's book of life, that's not a good book. I don't want anybody to read the Joel's book of life. It's, it's, in, it's got all my faults, all everything, all my actions, all of my transgressions, all my iniquity. And it's in chronological order. It's in alphabetical order. It's, it's a terrible book. And, and I am going to be judged by the actions and even idle words recorded in that book. And I've come to tell you that if I'm judged by that book, I'm going to hell. That's, right. I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm going to hell if I'm judged by this book. But there is another book at judgment. And it's not the Joel's book of life. This book is the Lamb's book of life. And it records all his actions and all his decisions and all his purity and all of his righteousness and all of his innocence. And if my name is written in the Lamb's book of life, then it's as if I was pure and I'm innocent and I'm holy and I'm blameless. Not because I was, but because he is. He's going to make me holy, but it's his holiness. He's going to make me innocent, but it's his innocence. He's going to make me pure, but it's his purity. Yeah, so when you go down in those waters of baptism, it's an identity swap. I go down as Joel Urshan, and, and you can still call me that, but the Lord knows me by a different name. I go down as Joel Urshan, but when I come up, that old man Joel stays in the grave, and I come up with a new name on my life, and this is the new name and DNA of who I am. And when I stand before God in judgment, I stand there covered by the blood and the DNA and the record of Jesus Christ how else do you think I get to go to heaven I get to go to heaven because he ascends into the hill of the Lord he ascends into the tabernacle of the most high oh, yes. ah, glory to God so, so the, the interpretation the righteousness is in his name and because it's in his name I can release my name to his and he can cover me with his precious blood and after that Peace, peace, wonderful peace. The kingdom of heaven is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And in that order. This is why Abraham, Abraham understood the order. This is why, this is why, and he knew the power of righteousness. This is why when Sodom and Gomorrah were about to be destroyed, Abraham went to God. He was scrambling. How can I save these cities? How, how can I spare these souls? These, these people don't even know they're about to be destroyed by the wrath of God. And he thought, I, I know, I know, I know what will get God's attention. And God, God is raging. His eyes are flashing with fire. He's ready to pour out judgment. And Abraham said, oh God, if I can find 50 righteous. And the Lord said, righteous? There's righteousness. Abraham knew the power of righteousness because when he believed in God, that's all he could do. He wasn't innocent or pure or holy. All he could do was believe and obey. And God said, I'll count that as righteousness. He counted it unto him for righteousness. Yeah, okay, all right. I know you can't do anything, but if you'll believe and obey, I'll count that. I'll take that. That's righteousness. Hallelujah. And, and, and Abraham said, God, if I could find 50 righteous. And the Lord said, yeah, 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 go ahead. Yeah, go, go find 50 righteous and I'll spare the cities. And Abraham said, what about 40, 45? And God said, 45 will do. 40, 40 is fine. 30, absolutely. 20, no problem. 10, if you can find 10 righteous, I will spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And here was the problem. 
Abraham stopped because he knew of ten who should have been righteous. Righteous Lot. Remember Lot's wife. He had two sons. They had sons, so at least two sons. Had daughters who had never known a man. Had sons-in-law, which means he had daughters who had known a man. At least ten. And Abraham knew should be righteous. And if who knew to be righteous would have been righteous, God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah. If the church would be the church, that will turn our cities upside down for the glory of God and for His great name. If the church would be the church, righteousness will come to our cities. Peace will flow through our neighborhoods if we will be what God has called us to be. Hallelujah. Righteousness will exalt our nation. Legislation, they can try more legislation all they want. Legislation doesn't have the power, but righteousness will exalt a nation. And happy is the people whose God is the Lord. There is a river. The streams whereof make glad the city of God. I'm going to tell you, peace is going to flow like a river when the church commits itself to the righteousness of God. I want somebody just to lift your hand right now and say, Lord, help me. Help me to be righteous before you. God, I don't even know how. But I know in your name I can be holy. In your name, I can be pure. I wonder if there's somebody in this house. I feel the Holy Ghost right now that could stand to their feet and say, Oh, God, I want to be righteous. I want to be righteous. Ah, hallelujah. I wonder today if there's somebody can let the order get reset. Maybe you got things out of order in life. Things are just out of order. God wants to put it in order right now. He wants to put it in order right now. Come on, let him order your steps. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Let him order your steps. I'm opening this altar right now for somebody to come to the front of this house and say, Lord, let me get it in order right now. Come on, somebody, maybe this is your first time here. God wants to help you get things in order. Maybe you've been here for 25 years God wants to help you get some things in order I want somebody to come get their house in order here's how you get your house in order first righteousness and then peace and then joy in the Holy Ghost somebody here wants peace I want everybody who wants peace I want you to come right now Everybody that wants peace, come on, come on, come on, come on. Everybody that wants peace, come on. He'll give you peace. But first, he's going to establish righteousness. <laughs>